Hi, friends. Welcome to Romans chapter 7, a very important discussion today as we talk about how legalism, and that is the desire or belief that I can curry the favor of God through my adherence to the law. Now, we know, I think most of us know, that we can't be justified by the law. And yet, sometimes we kind of buy the the false notion that, well, I wasn't saved by works, and I wasn't saved by keeping the law, but now that I am saved, I find favor with God based upon my adherence to the law, and now all these rules apply, and that's not true either. Now, please hear me out, because I am not saying that the saved life should be a licentious life. I'm not saying that the saved life of a child of God should disregard the law of God in the sense that it helps us to understand things about the, the character of God and so forth. What I am saying is that legalism is just as alive and well in salvation regarding justification as it is in sanctification, and it must abysmally fail if we understand it properly, which I hope to explain today. So look at Romans chapter 7, that's our context, in verse number 6, where the Bible says, but now we are delivered from the law. So remember, the law to the Jews would specifically refer to the law of Moses, to the Gentiles who did not have access to the law of God through Moses, there was still a law, the law of their conscience. So the Bible says, but now, now after that we're saved, after that we have been delivered from the law. Remember, we're not under the law's demands. The illustration we used yesterday, it's like a woman whose husband has died. She's no longer under his jurisdiction, now being delivered from the law, that being dead, that being dead wherein we were held. So sin has been defeated, it's died, we died with Christ, so we are, in that sense, dead, so we're delivered from the law and its demands. The law does not apply to a dead person. Look at verse number six, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So as believers, we don't serve in a measure up capacity, Like these are all the things the law said that I could not do before I was saved, but now I can keep all of those laws and I need to keep a list of all those laws so that I can measure up and then God can be pleased with me. That's not what the Bible is teaching. In in fact, that actually is counterproductive, as we shall see in this very passage. The point is, now that I have been born of the Spirit— Now that I am dead to sin and alive unto God, I can serve with newness of spirit. I don't have the fleshy, I I don't have the, the, the cold and calloused table of the heart. I have the fleshy. God has written his word in my heart. And now I have the indwelling Holy Spirit who can guide me and speak to me. Uh, the, the spirit I am not to quench or to grieve, but whose voice through the word of God uh, I should listen to. Look at verse number seven. What shall we say then? So, so if I was not saved so that now I have a capacity or a responsibility to keep the law, then was the law even a good thing in the first, pl- first place? That might be the question. So Paul says that in verse seven. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? So if if the law is doesn't serve any good purpose in the life of the believer, or at least ostensibly doesn't, it does, then is the law itself sin or does it equal sin? Verse number seven, God forbid, perish that thought. God forbid, nay, no, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. That's very important. So what's the Paul, what's Paul doing here? He's showing us the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is to demonstrate to us that we are lawless, to show us the need. The law was never intended to save anybody, either in justification 
or in sanctification. No, the law is that that mirror. The law is that spotlight, right? And Paul said, I would not have known my identity were it not for the law. And I, I find it very interesting because Paul has kind of given his personal testimony here. In fact, Romans chapter seven is in many respects autobiographical for Paul and that he talks about his own struggles. He talks about his own history. And remember, when it came to law keeping, nobody outdid Paul. Paul talked about that in Philippians chapter three. I mean, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was the most separated one that you could possibly find is what he said. And I was more zealous of the traditions of my fathers, he told the Galatian believers in Galatians chapter one. So, I mean, if anybody had a fighting chance at salvation by works, it was the apostle Paul. And he said, and I failed abysmally. So what he says here is, I would not have even known my sin were it not for the law. And then it's really interesting that what he says is, I would not have known lust unless the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Now, I don't think that's an accident. I think when the Apostle Paul cites that commandment of covetousness as the one that ultimately slew him. Now, why? Well, think about it. Most of the commandments the ones that deal with our relationship with others. Now, when it comes to loving God and and putting God first, we all kind of subjectively think we do that. But when it comes to treating each other, there are some more objective commandments like don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal. And I think Paul genuinely believed that I've never done those things. You know, I've kept the Ten Commandments. I've kept the Decalogue. No doubt that's the way he was raised. That's what he thought, being schooled under Gamaliel. I think the Apostle Paul really believed that he was a follower of the law. And yet here he says, but there was something that was convicting him even back in those days. And that was this. The law said, don't covet. And while Paul could fake it on the outside, like I've never killed, I've never stolen. I've never committed adultery. One thing he could not deny was, yeah, but I do desire things I shouldn't have. Positions and and stuff and, and I've coveted. You know what that law speaks to? It speaks to the heart. And what the law revealed to, to Paul, to Saul, was my heart is wrong. And I might be able to fool other people I might be able to put on the outside a modicum of law keeping, but in my heart, it slays me. It's it's slaying me. It's showing me that I am a sinner. And that's what the word of God does, by the way. It shows us the thoughts and intents of our heart. It cuts us apart. That's the language I think Paul wrote Hebrews, but whoever wrote Hebrews, that's the language of Hebrews chapter four. Look at verse number seven again. So what should we say? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, except the law had said thou shalt not lust, or or I I had not known, known lust rather, except the law had said thou shalt not covet. Now, watch how he expands upon this. Verse number eight. But sin taking occasion by the commandment. So, Sin is so deceitful. So sin actually used the law. Sin taking occasion by the commandment. Watch this. It wrought in me, worked in me, all manner of concupiscence, uh, uh, deceitful and and insidious sin in our life, uh, all kinds of deviant desire. It wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. So the Apostle Paul is giving his testimony and saying sin deceptively used the law to deceive me and, and show me just how wicked and vile I am. Think about how deceitful sin is. I think sin deceives in a number of ways, but three of them are this, uh, are these. Number one, I think sin deceives us by presenting an exciting option. 
boy, this is going to work for you. This is going to bring happiness. This is going to bring satisfaction. And of course, that's a lie. I think a second way by which sin deceives us is that sin builds in its own excuses. Well, I deserve this, or I'm not as bad as the next guy, or this is not really technically a sin because I'm not doing it, I'm just thinking it. And all the ways by which human beings have this capacity to justify their own sin. So sin, I think, deceives us by the excitement it advertises. I think sometimes sin deceives us by the excuses that are built into its behaviors. But I think number three, sin deceives us by providing us the false notion that we are the exemption to the rule, that I am the exemption to the rule, that I am exempt from sin's penalty. You know, other people have done this, but but this won't happen to me. You know, I, I'm the exemption to the rule. Okay? This will not happen to me. I, the, I, I have an exclusionary, exclusionary benefit. And of course, that's a lie as well. Why? Because the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we must all stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, or we must all give an account of ourselves before God might be the better verse to quote there. What's the point? The point here is that sin is a deceptive thing. Verse number nine, where Paul says, I was alive without the law once, I think what he's referencing here is there was a time of innocence in my life where I was not aware of my sinfulness. Now, every person is born a sinner. We know that. We established that in Romans 5. But I think what Paul was saying is there was a season of innocence in my life where maybe as a young child, we talk about the age of accountability, even though that's not a term that's found in the Bible. I think it's principles taught right here. And that is, yeah, I, I was alive without the law. In other, in other words, I, I wasn't being held accountable for what I didn't know. Sometimes people ask me about babies that die. Do they go to heaven? I believe so. I think this is one of the verses that helps us to understand that. Why? Because God doesn't hold us accountable for what we do not know in this sense. I think that would, this would refer even to people that struggle with a, a mental deficiencies and mental retardation. I don't think you're supposed to say it that way anymore, but you know, you know what I mean. So the point here is I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came and revived, I died. So when I became aware of, knowledgeable of, my own sinful choices and the accountability that they bring, that's analogous to spiritual death. There's no hope there. Uh, I am, the wages of that sin is death. Uh, absent a resurrection or the intervention of Jesus Christ, I'm going to die not just the physical death, but a spiritual second death, eternity without God in an awful place called the lake of fire. So no, the stakes are high. So the Apostle Paul is referencing what, is good about the law. And what is good about the law is that the law screams to us that it is not sufficient to save us, but it is sufficient to condemn us. Did you get that? It is not sufficient to save us, not before we were saved, and it's not sufficient to save us now that we are saved. No, it was just sufficient to show us that we needed a much greater power and resource. And that is the grace and intervention of the power of Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit. Look at verse number uh, 11, or verse number 10, and the commandment which was ordained to life, I found, watch this, it deceived me. I'm sorry, verse, yes, for the, for, now, verse number 10, wow, am I losing it here at the end of this episode? And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. What I thought was my greatest hope was actually my greatest condemnation. What I thought was my best ally, hey, I'm better than other people, I'm keeping the law, was actually my worst enemy because it was showing me just how bad I was. Now, not enemy in the sense it's bad because the law was good because it showed Paul, I can't keep it. 
and this is not a means of salvation. I need Jesus. Verse number 11 in closing, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. So in what sense then does an increased adherence to law actually in some ways exacerbate sin in our lives? Have you ever noticed that sometimes the people that are the most fastidious about applying the law to your life are engaged in movements or in ministries where sin is rampant? Does legalism help us live more godly or does it actually cause us to sin more? The answer, I think you already know, is amazing. We'll talk about that next episode. God bless you, my friends.